Catholic elementary school. That's great, Noel. All right, I got two o'clock Eastern. Are you okay if I go ahead and get things started, Mark? No. Okay, well, we're <laughs> just <done>. kidding. <laughs> well, thanks everybody. I changed my mind. <laughs> of course. Nobody's ever said that to me, even though I do the yes. same dorky intro every time. Congratulations. Sweet. It, Thank you. It took eight years of webinars, but we're finally here. I love Hello, that. everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon. Good morning. If you're on the West Coast, uh, if you're watching the recording, no matter what time it is, I hope you're having a good day. We're here to talk about how to keep your cool when maybe people are annoying you a little bit. Perhaps you've been feeling that uh, in these uh, difficult times. We got somebody here to talk about those things. I'm super excited. It's gonna be a fun one. I'm Steven. I'm over here at Bloomerang and uh, I'll be moderating today's discussion as always. And just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Just want to let everyone know that we are recording uh, and I'll be sending out the recording later on today as well as the slides. So if you have to leave early, don't worry. We'll get all the good stuff in your hands. Uh, if you get interrupted, don't worry. You'll be able to rewind it and, uh, and relive all the, the wonderful moments you'll get from, from Mark and I over the next hour or so. Um, most importantly, please feel free to chat in any questions or comments along the way. We're going to try to save some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so don't be shy. I know a lot of you have already chatted in. Keep doing that. We'd love to hear from you. You can also tweet us. I'll keep an eye on those things. There's a chat box and a Q&A box. You can use either of those. I'll see them. Don't worry. I won't ignore you. Um, but we'd, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love for these to be interactive. And if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, just want to say an extra special welcome to all you folks. We do these webinars uh, at least every Thursday, although this is our third webinar of the week. This is capping off a, a great week of presentations we've been providing. Um, we love doing these webinars. But if you've never heard of Bloomerang, just for context, we're a donor database provider. So if you're interested in that, if you need new donor management software, or if you don't have any and you think you might need some, uh, check us out. You can find us on the web. Uh, you can watch all kinds of videos and learn about Bloomerang. We're pretty easy to find. So check that out if you're interested. Don't do it right now. At least wait an hour because my buddy Mark's here, uh, a friend of the program, Mark Pittman joining us. How are you doing, Mark? You doing okay? Long time listener, first time caller, Stephen. You're like a seven time caller. I, I know. I this know. is like, you're one of the OGs of the, the Bloomerang webinar series. Ooh. I remember back in 2013, we were like, hey, we want to start a webinar series. And we somehow convinced you, you were, you were gracious enough to, to help us out. It's so hard days. for me to consider talking to people. It's just one of those things that I find right. hard to do. It, you don't do that at all. You'll let me talk to people? Sure. <laughs> he Count loves it. In. If you guys don't know Mark, check him out. Concord Leadership Group. He's just a great guy. I mean, what can I say? He's all over the place. He's speaking at conferences. He runs his own conferences, helping out, helping out fundraisers all over the place. Um, and uh, he, he's a coach. He's, he's, he's particularly good at motivating folks, not just to, to ask for money, but, but in all areas of, of, of their work. And uh, he's been an inspiring uh, figure in my life. I've, I've enjoyed getting to know him and, and uh, late nights after conferences, perhaps over some drinks, taking on heady subjects. We can talk more like about that Sox. offline, but um, yeah. we're gonna, <laughs> you're going to get some of that knowledge over the next hour or so. And I don't want to take any more time, so I'm going I'm to stop sharing my screen, Mark. And I think Thanks. got it covered from there. So uh, the floor is yours, my friend. And what, my new book, um, The Surprising yeah. Gift of Doubt, is coming out in March. And some of this okay. is going to be parts of what you're, you're going to get. Yeah, it's a little yeah. book preview, pretty, right? Kind of. Yeah, this is okay. really fun. But is there, if we just get going? Do it. Go for All it. All right, cool. <laughs> I am so thrilled to be here, everyone. This is a really, ugh, I just love this topic. And I love helping people kind of sort through what's going on in the world. Why are people acting so dumb? Because it's not us, of course, that, is, that are acting dumb. It's other people. Um, so, Stephen, do we have it so that it's just my screen? Yeah, it looks like it's working okay. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't to me. So, oh, if it's a speaker view, maybe mm -hmm. that's it. Could be. Um, I'm just gonna why don't I just share a screen? Okay. Instead of doing <laughs> this, this fancy thing. Okay, cool. I'm going to just go back to this and then share screen. Boom. We are good to go. All right. There it goes. Cool. So the um, people are often so weird. And when COVID-19 hit, uh, people got even more stressed out and they started acting in ways that just didn't make sense to any of the rest of us. Of course, what we were doing was totally logical, but wouldn't it be great to have like some sort of 3D uh, set of glasses so we could kind of see what why are people acting differently? Because they don't seem to, they seem to be doing stuff that makes sense to them, but it doesn't make any sense to us. Maybe a decoder ring would be better. Like we used to get in the cereal boxes so we could try to 
to figure out, okay, this is what they're giving me. And if I put in these coordinates or these letters, then I can actually understand what they're saying. Fortunately, there was this uh, psychoanalyst in Germany, Karen Horney, who created a, she, she was observing the world and she was uh, noticing that people tend to have 10 different instinctual stances. Um, and you can look on Wikipedia or in her books, there are some links to the books in the end. But the 10 stances, she, as she was working with them, she realized these actually clump into three different stances. There's the expressive or the aggressive stance, the compliant or dependent stance, and the detachment or withdrawing stance. Um, these, I've learned these from Susan Stabile. She calls them stances. Uh, Karen Horn and I call them needs um, or instinctual needs. Uh, what I love about it is this became like the decoder ring for me. This became the um, a, a very helpful way of looking at the world and looking at the relationships around me and the people that I work with and trying to figure out why are they doing things that are so seemingly dumb. I know this is recorded, so I had to put the seemingly in there, but you all know what I'm talking about in your own work areas. The expansive, ex aggressive folks are always moving towards people. They um, have, ex they, they don't, it's not even that they're deciding, these are instinctual, so it's before you're thinking about it, this is just their way of orienting to the world. They um, have a need for power, and they sort of just can't imagine not moving forward. They don't, they don't, you can read the text on the screen, many of you, if not, there's, the PDF will have it too. Um, but they just seem to think that the, the future is not written yet, so why don't we act on it? Um, they, people are around them to help them figure out the future. That's kind of their orientation to people. And um, with the aggressive stance, there's a need for social recognition on some level, whether it's, it's uh, different letters after their name or um, pro you know, prominence in, a in an organization. There tends to be some being out front involves also having being seen um, or at least being known. Um, so that, that, and they're the ones that are total personal achievers. So that is one stance. And so some of them, they're probably driving, many of the people on this call know people like this and these people drive them nuts because that's not all there is to life. Go, 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 hustle, 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 hustle. Isn't the only thing that there is in life. You, if that's you that feel is feeling that you might be in the, what Karen Horn and I called the compliance stance. We call dependent now with, uh, some of the more, some of the work I've been doing with Susan and you, in the vein of Susan Stabile and others, um, that uh, the dependent folks move towards people. So their first instinctual thing is to think about who's around us. Um, they do it for a need for, they want to be a, have approval, but not in the social admiration way, but just kind of in the um, being liked is important to them. Um, there tends to be a, uh, just a natural, before it even is thought about, a, ability to just self-face and not really think too much of themselves. Um, they... It, partly motivated out of not wanting to be abandoned. They really want to be connected with people. And they, they think that there are, um, when there are demands, they tend to not want to have uh, them placed on themselves. They tend to be like, look into the woodwork or kind of blend in with others. Um, they're really hoping somebody else will fix life's problems. And, and that's the, this is Karen Horney's descriptions, um, but I find it helpful to look at sort of who, what would the original source, and then I'll rehash these in a little bit less pejorative way going forward. The third stance is the detachment or withdrawing stance. These are the people that are moving away from people. So you have people that are moving against people, the aggressives, people that are moving toward people, the dependents, and people that are moving away from people, the withdrawing. They instinctually, before they think about it or whatever, their first stance is almost to take a step back. And um, they have this real need, not only for solitude and independence, but they have a real need to, to do things correctly. Um, and it's not just doing it correctly, it's just that if, it's not worth trying if it's going to, if anything is flawed, it's a moral failure on their part. Um, they have a disregard for others, but there's no resentment or animosity. Of it. It's just, they don't, they don't, it's not something that's important to them. Um, and they have a tendency to really not be in touch with their feelings around them. Um, they feel that everything that they do has to be so refined that it would be unquestionably good, or it would just be obvious. And so they take the time back to go back to refine and continue refining. Um, we call these three, the aggressive, the dependent, and the withdrawn. And you probably recognize some of these in your interactions with people. Uh, Pre-pandemic, during pandemic, now as we're going back into school and stuff at the time of this recording, um, 
trying to figure out why aren't people making decisions and other people are trying to figure out why are they always making decisions? Why aren't they taking a step back and amassing knowledge? Um, and the dependents are thinking about like, why isn't anybody looking around to see how these decisions could impact the rest of us? Um, the, to review these, because I want you to really get this. And I think that the three, it was good to look at Karen Hornei's original stuff, but the three uh, stances in the, independently will help you most help be most helpful as those code, those uh, those three D glasses for you. Aggressive, fast paced, future focused, social recognition. They are their instinct when things happen, when crisis hits, is to get out there and change the future because the future hasn't been written, so it can be impacted. It never comes into their mind that they can't change the future. Uh, the dependent would be the ones that are more present focused instead of future focused. They're they're aware of others and the fact that decisions we make now affect other people around us and we should actually check in with that which is a strength on teams aggressors may not understand that as a strength but it is a strength on teams um and they want to know how the the kind of systemic fix to a problem not just taking action for taking action sake aggressors could be really happy because they're just taking action they're checking things off their list even if it's not the right list to be checking off of uh, and then the withdrawn are more past focused in a sense of they're aware of the past. Um, they really want to do things to minimize personal impact. Uh, and they, they have a different need for their own space. So some of you have bosses who are, or board members, board chairs, who are withdrawing stance. They can be the best bosses in the world. But when urgency strikes or Black Lives Matter protests come up and there's this real need for, we need to express the equity that our organization already stands for, you didn't have the urgency or sense the urgency in those leaders that you were expecting. Um, and that could be just because the, those leaders were thinking about take, protecting their space and trying to refine the statement so it was perfect. Or their leaders were more dependent and they wanted to look out around them and just see who all, are we wording this correctly? Are we haven't, you know, what is the right way? What are other organizations doing? when you might've been that aggressive stance of just, let's just get something up there. Let's, let's stand for what we believe in. Um, the instinct for the uh, aggressives, I'd love to see in the chat, if I can see the chat. Um, I think I can open the chat here somewhere. Well, Steven, you can see the chat. What, let's, yeah, here we go, chat. Um, I'd love to see where, who thinks they're aggressive. How many people here think they're aggressive? Just put a Y in the chat. All right, there's a bunch of you guys. Okay, I get that. <laughs> That's totally my thing. How about dependent? How many people think they're dependent? The instinct to be more toward, you put a, uh, maybe a, a Y or a D. Yeah, somebody put a D. Way to go. Uh, I, it's going too fast, I can't see. Um, and then for, how about put a W for the people that think that they're probably more withdrawn. See that, Emily? Yeah, nice. Um, if it's possibly two, yeah, I've heard that it, I don't know if it's possible to be two or to have them stacked. Sometimes in these frameworks, it can be that there's a more forward thinking part that you are, and then there's a, a stack or a blend between them. What I love about that question, I wish I, ah, oh, you guys are so great. This is a really interactive group. Um, Amanda, um, what I think is good about knowing them is that once you know that there are options, it's like taking off the glasses and realizing, oh, not everybody sees the world this way, like through these lenses. Maybe there's a different, a different way I can operate here. Um, so it goes beyond just why are you bugging me? You're always out there or you're always pulling back or you're always checking in with other people. Uh, whatever the one that's bugging you is. You can also think, what's my natural reaction? You could ask some trusted people that aren't out to get you. Uh, just, you know, share with them that. And then you could think about expand that space between when something happens to you and you respond to it, just kind of live in that space, even if it's a couple of seconds and think, what's the right role here? Should I be going in to fix it? Or should I be just checking in with a person in front of me? Or maybe I need to take a step back and let them figure this out for themselves. Uh, I think that's one of the very powerful dependent withdrawn people are always getting in my way. David. <laughs> <laughs> and so you'll see, check the chat if you want to see some of the, the comments and the ways you're bugging other people or other people are being bugged. That's awesome. Um, I neither condone it nor, uh, nor, nor uh, condemn that remark <laughs> because we all frustrate each other. Now, I promised in my pre-work um, pre to, uh, or in my promotion this morning, 
I love the way these three stances in themselves, they're helpful to know. And we could spend a lot of time with question and answers. How do we interact with that? Which we definitely feel free to. And Stephen, if you see questions, definitely interrupt uh, whenever you feel you want to. Uh, what I also like, there's this tool out there called the Enneagram, which I've been, I've been around and exposed to for a long time, but I've only started using it in my professional work for the last couple uh, with others the last couple of a few years. Uh, some of you saw me at the nonprofit storytelling conference when I shared this a few years back. Um, what I love about these three stances is that this nine type typology, the Enneagram means symbol of nine, gram, ennea, writing of nine or drawing of nine. Um, it also seems to overlay well with the aggressive dependent and withdrawn stance. Let me tell you what I mean. Um, there are nine types in the, in the Enneagram. It's incredibly dynamic with arrows and all sorts of different layers. But one of the layers that is about this is overlaying the, different, the three different stances Karen Horn and I brought out. Now, if you're, uh, if you're familiar with certain teaching with the Enneagram, there's Peacemaker, they have labels, uh, Protector, Peacemaker, Perfectionist, Caretaker, Achiever, Tragic, Romantic, Investigator, Loyalist, Enthusiast. Those are the ones that I put on the slides but I will always refer to the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, because those don't have emotional <laughs> connections to them. I know some twos that are not caretakers, they're helpers, but they're not caretakers. And I know some fours that are not tragic or uh, romantics, they're authentic people. Um, and I, as you know, I know some sevens that prefer not to be seen as enthusiasts, but epicures. So there's all different ways that we can accurately label these, but the numbers stand for themselves. So you'll hear me use those numbers uh, a little bit more as we go through the rest of this talk, the just next few minutes and through the question and answers. Um, I cannot see responses except with the panelists. Okay. Um, I'm sure Stephen's on that. So um, good. I will, I'll let Stephen do tech and I'll keep doing teaching. The, those that are aggressive in the Enneagram language are achievers or well, three sevens and eights. And the reason that this is kind of nice to, to know is that within the aggressives, it's not just like a cohesive block of go-getting people. There are different reasons within it. Threes, they want to be more about success and seen as a success. They're very good at going into a group and just being able to express, just know what, other, what that group kind of values, what they see success as. Well, um, and so then to embody that, and they do that to help the group move forward. And, but failure to them is seen as a really bad thing. So they don't want to be in, a, that's something that they're trying to avoid is they want to be appreciated because they're a success. Um, and so failure would be against that. So that's the way they see the world. They don't want to talk about their failures. Sevens, on the other hand, totally aggressives. But they're not failure. They'll talk about it the minute after it happens. Oh, man, I just messed up here. You could learn from this too. Sevens are people that are, feel that to successfully be in the world, they have to be up. They have to always be positive and energetic. And, and um, the minute things seem normal, let alone pandemic, lock home, you know, stay at home stuff, they start getting worried because they feel like they might fall off this cliff that normal will lead to sad, which will lead to this gaping void of, of just nothing. Um, and so sevens feel like they have to have shine, you know, they keep looking for the shiny new object. Um, they keep looking for the next tool, the next excitement. Um, I was joking with somebody earlier today that I planned my whole life as a speaker and a coach around, as a seven around the new, because I'd be flying to a new place or talking to a new client or working with a new project. And now we're, that's been shrunk quite a bit because this right here is my stage for the next couple of years. Um, then eights, there are different type of aggressives also. Eights have this incredible, like you can feel their presence when they walk in the room often. They're, they, they are, uh, power is something that eights are just a commodity they deal in. They don't even realize it. Um, they will vigorously be talking to you and you'll feel like you're, they're arguing with you. And they don't even realize that they, they're coming across as confrontational or intimidating. Their big aim is to control, to control spaces so that they won't be bullied and the people around them won't be bullied. So it, eights, mature eights, healthy eights can be wonderful leaders because if you're in their inner circle, they're going to do everything they can to keep all the other stuff of life at bay. They're going to try to protect them. 
Um, so those are three different ways of looking at, at aggressive. Some aggressives are looking to be look successful. So if you're trying to talk their dialect, it might be helpful to show how taking a step back might be more successful than actually pressing forward if that's if that's a perspective you want to give. Others are looking for new experiences. And so you could probably see, maybe see how um, there's something new or something um, exciting or, or different about it because differences are good for sevens. And then for eights, it could be this is how this will protect us as we look at this fundraising objective, this will protect us. Or as we're talking to a donor, you might be able to say, if by investing in this matching program now, this will protect you. Uh, this will protect our organization so that we can continue serving our mission as we go through the rest of this pandemic. If you're dealing with people that are, are the more dependent stance, those are usually the ones, twos, and sixes in uh, Enneagram speak. Ones have this amazing ability to know that there is objective truth out there. They know that there's a moral right or wrong and uh, their whole orientation is they're not meeting it. Um, the uh, just recent, I, I just had an interaction with somebody online who um, often puts out negative in their comments. The way I read it is negative. It's always how something falls short of perfection. Um, but that, that person could be a one where they just want to, uh, they, they, they think they're loving on somebody by helping them see this is where you're falling short. It's not so much you're falling short, but you can do better. This is where you can improve because they naturally think everybody else wants to improve too. Um, so their, their way of being dependent is, is maybe it looks like micromanaging. It could be saying their way of looking at other people might not be so much the obvious help for the rest of us, but it could be, hey, you're, that grammar is wrong or that process is wrong, or they could be pointing out things that are, that are bad or falling short. Uh, just know that ones have these, and we all have an inner critic, ones have it on steroids. Um, that some people talk, say that they have an inner choir of critics because they're living in such condemnation so consistently, it's, it's, it's really harsh for them. So that might help us build, if we see some of the dependent folks and maybe they're a one, it might help us have a little more compassion. Um, and ones, one of the big things for ones is to know good enough sometimes is enough. Excellence isn't always required to get in, in all situations. Sometimes just done is better than not done. Um, twos want to help because they want to be liked and they're really good. They're looking to other people. They have this amazing ability to be able to help people because they kind of know what people need before those people even know it. Um, they, what, what they don't realize until they've done some work and just kind of got in touch with themselves is that there often is a quid pro quo that comes with that, um, that they're helping because they want to be helped in return. Now, the problem with that is sort of like fundraisers who just expect donors to know that we need money. Um, twos don't necessarily ask for help because they can see what other people need for help. So why isn't everybody else seeing that? Well, it's because their superpowers being able to see the need. Um, and so they are part of where their growth is, is learning to be able to um, expand their ability to ask for that. But if you're dealing with someone in a dependent sense who seems to be looking around, um, their helpfulness may be a clue to you that they may be looking to, to, they may be someone that actually you can kind of deputize to say, could you go talk to people and, and see how this is going to affect them? Because the twos will know, have this ability to read where people are at in a different way. Sixes, on the other hand, are more dependent stance too, but they are amazing at being able to see everything that can go wrong. So they're in the same, uh, they're, they're in a similar mode of sevens where we're, sevens are trying to move forward. Sixes are um, not trying to avoid pain by moving forward, but they're trying to avoid pain by planning for every contingency. Uh, this often for the rest of us can look like a lot of questions. Um, especially when we feel like we finally got that right fundraising proposal. And then the donor asks us another set of questions, which to us seems like a whole policy statement. Like, and, and so if you're, if you're always asking questions, one of the things you might want to be aware of, and if you think you might be a six, is that sometimes you're, you're asking for questions, which seems perfectly legitimate for you. You're reaching out to other people. You're trying to figure out how do we protect ourselves. That could come across like you're questioning our integrity. So just be careful with that. Um, people don't always understand that you're motivated out of a deep passion. The great things about sixes is once they, they're, they're kind of stress testing people and systems to make sure they're trustworthy. Once they deem that they're trustworthy, boom, they're, they're in, all in. They're 100% committed and incredibly loyal. Um, and so these can be some of your best supporters. They can be some of your best colleagues and bosses too, because once they're behind you, 
um, it's very hard to shake them from that. And then with the withdrawing, as we look at Enneagram and thinking about this, um, the fours, fives, and nines tend to be in the withdrawing stance. Um, fours have this deep seated need and ability to express themselves authentically. They want to be known and they can't stand inauthenticity. When something smacks of, of less than anything authentic, it really irks them. Um, so when you're looking at the people that are withdrawing and taking a step back, it may be because they're because they don't see an authentic reason for why everybody else is moving forward. Um, now, let me just say this now. Um, none of these personality types or stances are excuses for not doing your job. Um, there comes a point where you just, you work environments are artificial environments. So sometimes you just have to do the work. <laughs> you just have to do what's in front of you or what your boss is asking you for. And if it crosses an ethical line for you, then you need to find someplace else to do it. <laughs> um, having said that, fours bring a tremendous gift of um, really making sure that what we do is truly to, to mission and unique. Uh, they can also have, uh, one of the other things fours, many fours are good at is artistic flair, uh, an ability to give an aesthetic to our work and that, uh, the rest of us wouldn't see we needed it until it's shown to us and we realize, wow, that makes us a lot, lot better. In this withdrawing stance, another type of withdrawing stance is a five. Fives um, are the, probably the classic withdrawing stance and the fact that uh, fives in Enneagram speak need space. They love to be in rooms without windows. They, um, the way that Suzanne Stabile and some others teach Enneagram is that fives wake up in the morning knowing that they have a certain amount of energy in any unpredicted meeting, schedule, surprise, debits that energy from the account. Um, they're hoping to have en enough energy to get through the day so that they can recharge and sleep and come back the next morning. Um, and so if you're, you have a boss that's a five that's withdrawing, so they pulled back and you're constantly banging on their door, you're saying, hey, we gotta get this news, this news. You know, they're, if they're, you're waiting for them to proof your newsletter or your fundraising appeal, <laughs> They, it can be really frustrating because they don't sense the urgency. Their focus is on getting it right. And so what they want to do, fives are this amazing ability to amass knowledge. They can consume vast quantities of knowledge. Um, and in consuming, sometimes they can forget that they haven't done anything yet. Um, so the, the doing is necessary too. But um, if you're, it, it, one of the things to parse, to think about is if you're being led by a five, you've got somebody who can, is very gifted at uh, quantifying knowledge and that's really needed. And then the last part in this is the nines. These are the uh, top of the Enneagram. They are the people that are the most able to be, see everybody else's perspective. They have a deep need for harmony and for a lack of strife and a lack of conflict. And so that takes a ton of energy to do. Um, you may not see this, but this is incredibly tiring for nines. Um, and so they lose a sense of what their own desires are. So if you ask a nine what they wanna do, they may not know. But then, so you suggest uh, an example I hear commonly in, uh, is, so, you know, if you ask a nine, where do you want to go for dinner? Well, I don't know. So you suggest, let's go to get to the Chinese restaurant down the street. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. So nines can often be very clear on what they don't want to do, even though they aren't necessarily clear on what they want. And so for a nine, if you're a nine, you could, a process of figuring out what you do want could be looking at all the things you don't want and seeing what's left. Um, but if you're a nine, if you have a boss that's a nine that's withdrawing, nines are often called the nicest people in the world because you can talk with your boss and you will get the sense that they totally see your perspective and invariably they do. It doesn't mean they agree with you, but they have enough space in their, in their being to be able to entertain a bunch of different uh, perspectives and, and uh, viewpoints at once. Um, there are numbers of nines that come out of board meetings or donor meetings where feeling like, uh, even though different opinions are expressed, the everybody in the room feels like that the the nine understood them and agreed with them. <laughs> so nines, you need to be careful because your your nodding and your appreciation or ability to see that could be taken as agreement, and so you need to be clear about that too. So hopefully, I mean, this is really powerful stuff. I'd love to talk about real donor experiences, real bar, board experiences, real boss experiences. I won't read names. So that, you know, when I know we're recording this, I'd read names earlier, but if as Stephen and I go through the question and answer part, we'll try to keep some sense of um, distance between it. But when you think about the, the Enneagram, there's a lot of depth in this. There's a lot of different ways you can go. 
You can also just keep it simple and think about aggressive, dependent, and withdrawing. And think about why is that donor not responding to me? Maybe they're more of a withdrawing type. One of the things that um, Suzanne Stabile talks about when she talks about nines and their sense of withdrawing is nines don't, the nines will see work needs to be done, but it never occurs to them that it's theirs to do. Whereas a, an aggressive stance, a three, a three, seven, or eight would be like, of course it has to get done and it's mine to do. Even dependent stances would see that some things need to get done and it's theirs to do. Nines would just see, oh, that needs to get done. And there's not any awareness until they've done other work or, or changed in different ways. No natural awareness to know that needs to get done. Sharing that at a nonprofit storytelling conference, I had a person come up to me afterwards and say, that saved my marriage. You just saved my marriage. <laughs> After a few decades with this guy, I realized he's not necessarily being a, uh, an intentional jerk. <laughs> he's just not seeing that, yeah, that's on the floor and that needs to get picked up, but he's now has made the connection that he needs to do the picking up too. <laughs> it wasn't just a slam against her, which is cool. All right, Stephen, shouting out to all his fellow fives. Hey, Stephen, why don't we um, come back? If Would that be good? Uh, just so you have a preview on the um, uh, on the slides, you'll get all these different, a uh, whole bunch of different resources that I have found to be helpful. I'd love to hear ones that you found to be helpful too if you wanted to reach out to me. Uh, and if you have trouble with focus, even more, there's a free gift here. Uh, ConcordLeadershipGroup.com slash daily dash focus will help you to... Um, there's a, just a very simple template that I use for my days that have helped me know that I've successfully finished the day, even with all the different demands that come in. Uh, as a seven, I love all the different things, but I also like focus. <laughs> I like to have something I know I've done. So what are we seeing in the chat box? I only, I, I wasn't, it was a little bit too many things going on at once. Yeah, there are a lot of people uh, kind of identifying as their type. I had never seen those three groups before, but as soon as you started I, um, describing the withdrawn, I was like, oh, that's me. And then when you paired it up with the fives, I was like, oh man, he, he got me because I'm a withdrawn five exactly. Um, that's cool. That's really cool that you can see it so much, yeah. Do you recommend people take the test and, and kind of get the number and then sort of, is there a test for the first three groups or? Well, see, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, uh, there's, I don't know if there is for the first three and um, many of the people I listen to say there isn't really for the Enneagram either. <laughs> so, right. Um, the Enneagram is more of a wisdom tradition thing. So it's something you live out, you read the stories and see which ones fit with you. Um, but uh, I, there is a test. I just, I've used ready. The Enneagram is set. And so a lot of the tests, the reason I cringe is not nothing personal, but a lot of the tests out there are sort of like, which Disney princess are you? Right. So it's not really, there's, there's not the statistical verification and it's hard to with wisdom literature. So all that saying, um, I have heard, I've liked uh, ready, R-H-E-T-I, the Enneagram Institute's test. Um, and I've, and I've used that with some of my coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching clients and institutional ones. And there's also one I've tested a, once or twice with coaching clients from a, a long time, early Enneagram practitioner, uh, Jerry Wagner. So Wagner Enneagram personality system or something. It's apparently the only one that's verified by a psychiatric association. So that oh, was kind of cool. Good. Yeah. Um, and then the IEQ nine is one I just heard. I've heard about from some, some personalities, but uh, Beatrice Chestnut, who I really trust in the Enneagram uh, community uh, said that so far that's the best. There's still some sections she's not pleased with, but that's cause that gets into subtypes, which is a whole nother end area of Enneagram stuff, but I'm okay. geeking out and monologuing. Sorry. I'll no, stop. that's great. I think we want to hear this stuff. Cause I think people are sensing that there are a lot of those tests out there and then maybe some of them aren't as, aren't as good as others. So, yeah. And what I, I guess what I would say is have fun exploring. I mean, that's the mm. thing. It's um, be wary of anybody that says, oh, you're this type. I know you, you're this type. Because whereas there, the way I teach it is that there are uh, abilities that you have, things that you can just do quickly. Um, those are like Highlands Ability Battery tests that. I've heard Kobe tests that. Um, then there are behaviors. Mm. Like I'm a people person and I am, uh, you know, people, person, extrovert, you know, extrovert, yeah. introvert, people, task. Those are things you can see. I can look at people and generally see, yeah, they're probably extroverted. They're probably more introverted, but Enneagram is, it's the inside. It's the inner motivations. It's how you see success in the world. And so that's where I like the aggressive dependent withdrawn because you can see that. Mm. Uh, but if you start labeling people with numbers, that's not really respecting the Enneagram and it's not res respecting the person around you. Yeah. Well, speaking of, you know, I've been thinking as I was listening the last half hour, 
you know, at Bloomerang, for example, we, the senior leadership team took the, took these tests and we said, okay, this is what we all are. And it was a really good kind of team building. They exercise. took the Enneagram. Yeah. Awesome. We, we took another one. It was another one where the labels were like Defender and I, I can't remember the name of that okay. one, but it was like another one like these. And it was a great exercise. And good. then what we all did is we went to our departments and encouraged our our teams to take them. And then as the smaller teams, we had a great discussion. So it was a great experience. So that's super because if it's a yeah. part of uh, why I love these type of things, including the Enneagram is that it can give people a common language and Enneagram, even though it's talking about really personal things, it gives them more objective language for it and non-judgmental language for differences. So I love that. I love that use of it that you guys did. That's smart. So my question though, is you say we're listening to this webinar and maybe you're not the boss, but you want everyone to take the test how do you kind of do that from the bottom up, right? It's easy if it comes from top down leadership, you know, if it's, if it's an organization that sees the value, Smart. what advice would you have if you're listening? It's like, geez, everyone in the organization needs to take this test. How would I suggest that? Is that something they should, they should suggest them to be, to begin with? Yeah. Well, and again, and this is why, I mean, I can see on the one hand and then on the other hand, right. um, on the one hand, if you're the one pushing for something, it can be really off putting for everybody else because yeah. that zeal doesn't come up a lot in our work. Mm -hmm. And so that could be really weird. But what I would say is really get to know it yourself first. And so I, I know when I was introduced to it in the uh, late eighties, I just, read some books and then I let it sit for a few years. And then I read some more books. I had, a, there was a prompt that any grammar institute would put out every day, an email about your type, um, reminding you mostly about the pitfalls of your type, but sometimes about the good parts of your type. And as you learn it more and you start becoming more aware of who you are, because the goal isn't to be the best type you can be, hmm. it's to transcend the type. The way the Enneagram works is that um, all, we, all nine types are needed and it's part of just like the dependent, withdrawn and aggressive. We need all of those types in our teams. So the more in touch and, and aware you become of yourself, the more you can transcend that. And people will start wondering, why are you acting differently? They won't necessarily be pleased with that because some people had already learned that they can manipulate you or just depend on you to do things. Like if uh, one of the things that some people mourn is if you're if, in twos, listen to this, um, one of the a word like I need, if somebody comes to you and they say, I really need this, that can be almost Pavlovian for a two to want to get it done for them. Mm -hmm. um, so the, there is a dark side to learning this stuff, but I would say if you're middle man, middle in the organization or low on the totem pole, learning it can be really good and maybe sharing it with a friend. And if you find a test that you like, um, I know there are a lot of memes out there and that can be a way maybe for people to get into it as long as it's not, mm -hmm. I'm the best seven in the world uh, because yeah. the point, just remember, I mean, it's fun to play with that, but um, I love books. Like um, I, I think I've got it. Yeah. You can see them. You can see the top of them. <laughs> yeah. The, where I, I have this whole camera thing. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> over here, <laughs> there are uh, the nine types of leadership would probably be a great one for organizations. It's Beatrice chestnuts. Um, let me see if I can do this without pulling aside my computer. <laughs> Right here. Hot. And now out of the oven, we have <laughs> uh, Nine Types of Leadership by Beatrice Chestnut is one that was done in uh, hospital organizations and other and tech firms. So there's a, Enneagram can feel really woo-woo and she does a good job of making it so that it's open to others. Um, so I think that would probably be a good place to start. But I love nice. the road back to you, uh, Suzanne Stabile with Ian Crone and then Suzanne Stabile's The Path Between Us also are two good books. It's there are a like lot you, of videos too. Yeah. Like if you educate yourself, you shouldn't go around saying, oh, you're a four. That's why you're acting this way. It's so much fun four. though, because like, so <laughs> I was talking to somebody and uh, she may be on here, but um, her, she said that she was talking with a therapist and she said, I don't know if you've heard of the Enneagram. And the therapist said, oh, I know all about studies and research and science. And I'm very much about that. But the Enneagram gets me. Mm. <laughs> and so when you finally feel seen it's so liberating and exciting and so if you go if you gush over people that's just normal that's fine good all right <laughs> just, well i've i've uh, i've monopolized with my own questions so we got some good questions in here and i'm and like we I said, got a good group this is yeah fun. oh yeah the boomerang crowd i'm telling you I, awesome. I, I shouldn't be surprised and i'll keep i'll keep it anonymous folks even if yeah. you didn't and thanks for honor, honestly honestly yeah. but you said something earlier mark that might have prompted this question which is there's not, you, you can't just not do your job because of whatever number or thing yeah. you are. And, and the person here is asking, you know, can people actually use these, their label, their type as an excuse for certain 
behaviors, activities. What's your opinion on that? It seems like it shouldn't be always uh, be something that you fall back on as an excuse, but there are legit things that, that explain behavior at the same time, right? There are. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a, I want to be an adult about this because I'm I can't I can't stand people making excuses based on personality for why they can't do something. Um, uh-huh. So if it's done as a reflective excuse, like there's there uh, this is hard, and so maybe I can verbally process this. But organizations have roles that need to be done, and mm-hmm. as an adult, you've applied for that role and been hired to do a role. Now, the roles aren't always correct, and so there needs to be some latitude in fixing them. Um, a lot of fundraisers are on this call, and, and the fundraising is seen as one thing by some people, but it's really something else. A great example is typical nonprofit fundraising is, let's talk about our organization our, and our fundraising letters. Our organization's great. We do great work. Our staff is great. We're well-certified. We have great outcomes. We're super. Will yep. you please give us money? That's bad fundraising. Bad fundraising is, I mean, good fundraising is talking to the donor and doing it in a way that would never get a good grade in a high school English course. So, um, so there needs to be latitude in the job descriptions, but I would never, I, my fear in any of these assessments is that they're used to pigeonhole people, hmm. um, that, that leaders or staff would pigeonhole people as you're just a, uh, you're just this label. But I can't even understand why, other, why people would wanna even do that to themselves. Why would you yeah. limit yourself to no, I can't do this because I'm a five. Well then, you know, I, yeah, I, I have very big, big tolerance issues with people that use excuses like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure there's nuances and, and um, but everybody yeah. can grow out of this. I mean, some of the best five, uh, some of the best leaders are fives who don't want to be around people a lot of the day. They want a lot of structure, but they grow out of it and they are that frontward face. They just know that they have to like uh, Islamic USA uh, founder knew that as an introvert and I, we did introvert extrovert, he knew he had to flex to be an extrovert and talk in front of a crowd. He also knew that he took, needed three days of backup afterwards, like hanging out by himself mm-hmm. to be able to recharge when the rest of his fundraising crew was all like, let's do it again. That was fun. Right. Let's have another party. So <laughs> I think, I think it's more know your reserves, look for ways that you can do things um, just like you would in anything else. If you know, you take if you know you're normally three months late in doing annual performance reviews, start them three months before they're due and get them done so that you, you, know, you learn hacks to kind of accommodate as you learn to grow and adapt. That's that what makes I would sense. Submit. That was verbose. Sorry. And you, you it's a great talking, question. It's a really great question though. Keep using fives as an example, Mark. Like I'm not right here in front of you. It's, it's hurting my feelings a little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just well, kidding. then there's those fives. Oh, yeah, no, I, I figured it was safe because you are. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Um, we got some people asking about donors. Um, seems like, you know, and I should say, you know, asking in person is, is something that you coach a lot of people on. So and it seems like you would really want to be attuned to these, these personality types, maybe in like a major gift setting where you are doing a face-to-face ask or yeah. one-on-one. Um, in your experience, are most of those larger donors maybe more on the more aggressive side? And, and if so, no? I haven't found okay. that to be the case. The only okay. place, and I say this with tremendous respect because I've done a lot of work with Jewish philanthropy, particularly yeah. Orthodox Jewish philanthropy, Chabad and, and Aish and all, um, there seems to be, a Canadian uh, rabbi said that there seems to be a, a Canadian uh, Orthodox donor and an Israeli Orthodox donor, and the Israelis are much more of what you think of as an eight. They're sort of fill the, pres- the room with their presence. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, so there are some donors that they are donors because they want, the ego rewards, which is, hey, that's a reason for the giving. recognition. Um, yeah, yeah. But I haven't seen a consistent. I think uh, I think the problem for us as fundraisers is we start equating certain behaviors with success um, mm-hmm. instead of uh, and trying to pigeonhole leaders into those things. So yeah, there are some some really driven go getters. Threes are often CEOs of companies, as are eights. Um, sevens that are CEOs of companies too long usually find somebody else to be the CEO so they can be the visionary because mm-hmm. they, they are so not into s- patterns and, and systems and they're usually trying to flatten the hierarchy, not increase it. So they want everybody to be on the same plane. So the, out of the aggressives, threes and eights would be the more, most typical, but I've seen a lot of nine CEOs recently and 
through the last few years. I've seen a lot of five CEOs. Um, and so there are, yeah, I don't think it's just one type. And for those people that, that are the ones who want that recognition, you know, publicly, any, any tips there for, for, for those folks? It seems like there yeah. would be, yeah. <laughs> well, part of it is you need to get, this is where fundraising is so wonderful to me is that it really forces us to look at ourselves, our own stories about money, our relationship with money and power and systems. Um, because we may be very averse to money. We may, often fundraisers and board members have grown up in homes where you don't talk about money. Um, and it's, it's and disrespectful to, it's the original don't ask, don't tell. It's just something that's there and whatever. Um, and there's a lot of shame and guilt along with that comes along with money or not having it or having it. Um, so when a donor wants recognition, their name on a wall, their name next to somebody to be part of a group or even their name on a building that triggers different stories within us that we have to be really aware of um, because that isn't necessarily a bad thing. And it doesn't mean it's laden with all this egotistical narcissism that we may be projecting on them. It could be that it's a good business move for them and their community to be seen, or it could be that it's a good equity stance for them mm -hmm. to be seen as I'm behind this. This is something that I support. I'm a champion. Um, yeah. And I, and, and it's hard to know sometimes when we're dealing with people, especially one-on-one -on -one or in small groups is my response to that because of what they're giving me or because of what I'm putting on them. And so that's where we as fundraisers, one of the reasons I love all these different assessments and, and typologies is that we really get to, the better we get to be being ourselves, the more we clear the air so we can actually hear the donor and help them invest in stuff that they value. I love it. And so Burns? the other thing about that, sorry, Stephen, the yeah, other thing about it. it, which is a very hard line is never do anything that would break ethics. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, that's illegal or, or set very bad precedent. If they're asking to do something in your organization. So there's this interesting conversation and I might, I might step on the third rail here between donor centricity and community centricity. Yes. Um, and I think part of it is I'm really glad the conversation's happening. I'll start yeah. to say that. Um, because I think there's this weird mutated Frankensteinian donor centricity, which means that the, the whole nonprofit has to follow the donors. Donor worship, and yeah. Don't, yep. yeah, bow yep. down at the altar of the donor. Yeah. And that's not it at all. What nonprofits are so bad at communicating with donors that I think donor centricity came up because it was saying there's all this in the nonprofit and there's the donors too. And they're actually part of the nonprofit. They're not just out there. They're actually part of the whole mission. We can't do this, this, we can't do the nonprofit stuff without having the donors involved as well. So let's, let's yep. bring them all together. And so out of the, uh, in the organization, donors are a healthy part of the organization. I think that is a more centered view of this, but um, there are donors that have deep seated needs. They have um, unethical ambitions. They have uh, really inappropriate things. They put our, our different fundraisers of different, gender identities on different and really bad places. And yeah. none of those is worth any gift. And yeah. if you're in an organization that's telling you that it's worth a gift to flaunt yourself that way, I would really encourage you to seek other organizations because yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of nonprofits in the world. So, sorry, soapbox. Wow. I can, no, you, I, I mean, got a lot of soapboxes with this. <laughs> that's how we're doing it. And that dovetailed in my next question, which okay, is, great. it seems like it's impossible to, to not talk about the subject of burnout in, in this context. Oh. Right. I don't, yeah. I don't know another sector where people get burned out faster. Um, and maybe that's just because that's the sector I'm in and what I see the most of, but, um, yeah. and it seems like a lot of these personality types um, are more prone to burnout. What, what, uh, what can people do to prevent? Well, that? part of yeah, that's oh, so good. So perceptive and the I, fundraisers and executive directors and CEOs of corporations, um, the higher you go up in organizational structure and Western culture, the more isolated you get. Hmm. So it seems like the, and the more people trust you, well, you've been promoted. So you must have the goods to get things done just at the time when you're the reason you've been good is because you've been sparring with people and been able to have back and forth. And all of a sudden they're all hands off or they've hired you. You've had years of success. And so they're not pushing back anymore in ways that you found fun. And like, an, if you're an eight and you're a leader for you, you just want someone else to push back. Hmm. Um, so if you're dealing with an eight, they don't necessarily want to prove right or wrong. They just want to know that somebody else has a backbone and has passion. If you answer them with passion, they totally respect you in a different way. And that freaks out most of the rest of the, the people. So I have a, I, as a seven, I'm next to eight and I 
just didn't know, I didn't realize I was doing this, but I was working with a board chair who was very much a pusher, had a very bossy personality and uh, had been uh, very high and successful in the military and was working with another military leader in the nonprofit and understood chain of command and all. And so I would, as a, as a, I would respond to that, trying to speak to his dialect of pushing back. Um, but I tried to also let him know that I didn't, I wasn't trying to usurp him. I wasn't going over him. Mm. He, organizationally, he was the board chair. I was the outside consultant, but I would push back. And um, it was fun at one point to see him back me up in a meeting when his staff had thought I was ruining my relationship with him because they just didn't understand. I, I'm not conflict averse, mm -hmm. but it's because I think I'm so close to an eight on the Enneagram scale. So um, burnout, part of why I love um, the Enneagram too, is that there's in the paths, uh, in the different arrows, there are paths uh, to growth. One of the reasons I talk about fives a lot is as a seven, when I'm getting um, in a better space, it's when I'm moving more towards a five, when I'm able to have this objective time, be alone, not need extra stimulation, not need caffeine or new exciting tech toys or something around me or social media, just check the social media feed all the time. Um, so I know for me, that's something I need. Uh, if you're an aggressive, one of the things that you can do to help avoid burnout is learn to be withdrawn. I think that would be the first place to go because that's probably the most opposite. Uh, what I've heard a lot about in pandemic is uh, meditation for all types. Um, there's something brain-wise about the stress that cortisol, like if you Cortisol helps you focus. It's Jessica Sharp of Sharp Brain Consulting talks about how, have you had her on? No, I need to. Okay. She's, she's amazing. You should, yeah, th that would be a very, we can make that connection happen. <laughs> um, she the, it pu dilates your pupils and helps you focus and, and push out everything around you so you can just focus, which is incredibly helpful until it's not. <laughs> because mm -hmm. when it's just there, it cuts off all executive functions. So you don't think about the higher things. You just start reacting. You see that a lot on social media. Right. So anyway, so aggressives, uh, b avoiding burnout could be building that space, um, you know, and dependence, it could be trying, withdrawn would definitely be try trying to take action. Find safe places where you can take action that doesn't cost you your job. Hmm. And that when things don't always go the way it is, or you don't have it all figured out and it still works. Hmm. Um, that's why I love, if you're a boss listening right now, I love it when, you're, when staff has a side hustle okay. because they're, it's not so much a threat to the organization. As long as they're doing their job and meeting their goals, yeah. they're improving and learning skills that are directly transferable to most any job that you're, you've hired them to do. And they're learning it in a way that is ultimate responsibility for them. If they're not getting results, they can't blame a boss or someone else if they're doing their side hustle. So I think that's a very healthy thing. And, and finally, so they can control like it's theirs. And yeah, and they can realize, oh, I mean, I, I'm a much better, I remember when I joined, joined a hospital team, I was a much better employee because I'd been on my own. And I realized pushing the pencils around on my desk doesn't raise money. Mm -hmm. you know, repolishing that paragraph does not raise money. I need to get out there. I need to get asks out there and I need to track the asks because I'm ask reluctant. So I need to keep myself focused on how many asks I'm going to make, not how many friends, friends don't yeah. give money, donors do. So, <laughs> um, so then dependent would be trying to probably experience either uh, aggressive or withdrawn. But so burnout, um, the last thing I'll say with burnout, and I've heard, I've taken your vo verbal cues that I might be going too long on this. Um, <laughs> If you've ever listened to NPR, they're so fun to listen to the hosts like, <clears throat> uh, you know, do little things like that and trying to cut off the monologuer. Um, but the, <laughs> with burnout, I think one of the things is to the for all of our types to actually believe that we are worth taking a stand and taking care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's really hard for most of us because yeah. we're so, especially in the nonprofit sector, we want everybody else to succeed. Um, and so an easy way to do that, that I could leave you with you, with you for this session could be to block time on your calendar as appointments with yourself. Mm. Um, I know one nonprofit who I am so thrilled that this development director requires and his job description requires every staff in the development office take two hours of training every week. Oh, they do great. two hours of development, some sort of professional development, reading, webinars, something. Um, and that may not be the best place for you to start if you don't have that power to make that decision, but a half hour on, on company time, reading a book about something that's beneficial to you could be just a start of trying to exercise that muscle of self-care. I love it.
as a withdrawn five, I can speak to the power of a side gig. I think I've always had some side hustle. In fact, Bloomerang was a side hustle at one point in the early days. So, oh, that's yeah. so cool. It's very, it's very helpful. I mean, I wrote a book. That's, that, that was like the I ultimate. I know. That's so <laughs> ultimate, cool. Yes. I don't necessarily recommend that, uh, but um, oh, yeah. I know. I um, can't stop <laughs> writing them, but yeah, I don't necessarily <laughs> recommend it either. Speaking of verbal cues, um, can we talk about body language a little bit? You know, we're kind of in a virtual world where... Maybe we don't sure. see those things. <laughs> Let's do it. I'd love to. Let's do and, it. <laughs> yeah. And maybe uh, in an email or chat only world, some of those things are missed, right? Because yeah. we're not in person together. Um, what are the things oh, we should be looking out that's, for? I think that's one of the things where we could yeah. use some self-care of just when we get an email, maybe yeah. being a little bit more withdrawing before we respond to don't it respond or right text. Um, I consistently misread emails and voicemails. And yeah. Um, that's why you'll find extroverted people, centered people putting a lot of exclamation marks or, or smiley faces and stuff because print looks so unemotional and they want, you know, I'm still your friend. I still like you. Right. Um, so part of it is using and making sure if you're using your hands on a Zoom call or some sort of visual training, making sure you're using them above the, mm. the screen. Because if you're down here using your hands, nobody can yes, see it and it yeah. could look really weird. Um, so make sure you have it in the view of that. And so that's where you can just play with your camera angle, uh, whether you have a zoom or not. Um, and that you saw, maybe you saw that. I, I think I can make this go back a little bit. I'm not sure. But anyway, so that's one thing. Um, the, what was it, the more of the question about just how, how do you do it in a virtual environment? Yeah. And, and when you're not, what are maybe some of the, the body, uh, uh, the signals that you should, should also be looking for? I, I've noticed that I found myself using phrasing differently. Mm. Um, like, and I'm, I've always been the type of fundraiser when I was doing major gifts full time of letting the calendar be a reason why a donor couldn't meet with me. But Hey, would your schedule permit us to get together? Um, I know that that's not a good sales tactic. I know that there are good fundraisers yeah. out there that have a lot of success that say, no, Stephen, I want you to meet with me. And it's your, if you don't, it's on you. It's not, you can't get out of this. But for me, we're all busy. And so I like to let your schedule be the thing. And I've noticed phrases like, um, if you can't get to this, it's completely, I completely understand. Uh, if I understand, if I can't understand, I try not to use the word understand, but if you can't get to this, that's completely, that's totally fine. Um, trying to give some more grace in my wording because mm. they can't see the, they can't hear my voice or see me. Yeah. yeah I, I, I wouldn't do it in a fundraising to... appeal just so you, just for the record. Yeah. I, in a fundraising appeal, I'd still be direct That's and different. to the point and doing all the right things. Make the ask. I think it's a sign of respect when you're asking somebody for a commitment or any action, be clear with them what you want. <laughs> Yeah. So they can say yes or no, because if you're asking them just to support your cause, they may think that's a $15 gift and you're thinking 15,000. Mm -hmm. And I was joking earlier this week, I can't read my wife's mind of 25 years. Why would I expect a donor to be able to read mine about what I was right, asking? After a week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, I just got an email on Saturday where the subject line was like, don't open this on the weekend. It's non-urgent. And that was just, I had never gotten anything like it? that. Of course. Oh, of course. I'm, I'm a total... <laughs> you know, I'm not normal. So, so, so that's another thing with, with, with language though, setting expectations is really important. So yeah. as a, and then helping with burnout, I try not, I do work all the time. That's just how I am. And I yep, set up our too. family rhythms and stuff. I like that. It's life giving to me, but I try not to respond to client work at hours mm. that I don't want them to respond back to me. Mm. Uh, and then with my team, um, the VAs that I work with, I also, um, I'll send things and I'll try to, I haven't put it in the subject. I'll try that next, but I try to put things like, I really hope you're not seeing this till Monday morning um, nice. because I want it out there, but I don't want so I can get it off my yeah. emotional load, but I don't expect them to get it done. Um, and right. I think that's one of the hardest things as you move in management with people is that people don't do things the way you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's probably why you've hired them. So it's probably yeah. if we would be able to give a little bit more grace for that, it'd be good. I love it. Mark, what a fun combo. Any final <sighs> thoughts? It's almost three o'clock. I'll give you yeah, that. Yeah, it is. We're I can't believe an hour has gone by. <laughs> Just if anybody wants to uh, get in touch with me, it's mark at concordleadershipgroup.com. So mark with a, with a C. Boy, I'm having yeah. trouble today with this. You just had it. Thing. Uh, at concordleadershipgroup.com. I'm on Twitter. And uh, oh, yeah. you're all setting out the slides too, right? I'll send out the slides, recording. Anything, anything that... Uh, 
uh, folks want. They can get get it from you, right? I mean, and I guess anything. <laughs> my last word for everybody that's listening, and I, it looks like we've had a lot of people stick around. So I really yeah. appreciate that too. Is thank you. Um, if we've learned nothing else in the last six months, um, it's that nonprofits are vital to the way we've structured society, and whether that's the right structuring of society or wrong. Thank you for being part of that vitality. Thank you for being connecting the glue. Thank you for giving sanity to donors that are overwhelmed by mm -hmm. or problems that they don't know how to help, but donating to your organization, whatever the cause is, um, has been a tangible way of them feeling like they have some sense of control in the world. Mm -hmm. So thank you because you're, you're making the world a much better place. And I really appreciate that. Thanks, Mark. You're awesome. This is fun. <laughs> and thanks to all, for you, uh, all of you for hanging out. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll be sending everything out later uh, this afternoon. And we got a couple of webinars next week on Tuesday, going to talk about capital campaigns. Uh, so specifically for you folks who may be in the midst of one, maybe it was kind of turned upside down since March. We're going to have some good advice from Kevin and Carolyn uh, talking about capital campaigns. If you're not in the capital campaigns, that's okay. We've got other webinars uh, that we're going to be doing. I don't know why you wouldn't be in a capital campaign. It's such a fun an exciting topic, um, but lots of other sessions coming up here. We're going to be doing two or three webinars a week through the end of the year, so there'll be something for everybody. Um, so hopefully we'll see you again on uh, another session. So we'll call it a day there. Have a good rest of your Thursday. Uh, have a good weekend. Stay safe. We're all thinking about you, echoing uh, Mark's sentiments. We need you out there, so um, do the meditation. Stretch into the other, uh, the other personality type, whatever you need to do to uh, stay productive. But thanks for listening. We'll see you later. Thanks for being here. Bye now.